I sort of think we shortchanged, we, we sort of ran out of time at the end of last session. So I've decided let's go back and we'll use the, the sort of tail end of last session as a way of warming up for uh, the scriptures we have tonight. So um, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 13. And I'm going to be using tonight the New American Standard Version, which is a version that is known as a very literal translation. And that's a good thing and a bad thing because it doesn't read all that easily. The syntax, the way the sentences flow, um, sometimes it's not as easy to read as some of the other translations, but... Nonetheless, let me read now from the New American Standard Version. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, and of course, that's inclusive of the cistern as well, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Those of you with us last week will recognize uh, these references under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. We talked about the reference to baptism. So the, the Red Sea crossing is like a baptism. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Now, regular readers of the Bible, we get really familiar with the, the texts, the stories, these references, but that's pretty stunning for Paul to connect Christ, whom we recognize as having lived in the first century, to the 13th century, so a good a good 1,200 plus years prior to when Jesus of Nazareth is living, Paul is making a connection. Now we, it's easy for us to go, oh, that's a symbol, and I would add the word mere symbol. It's just a symbol. Paul is talking symbolically. We know. We know symbols and, you know, I, I think this is where we start to kind of lose track of what Paul is actually doing. He's making a statement that has implications for the way we understand time. And I'm just putting that out there for the moment. But it would be, it would really be worth our time individually in our prayer time, whatever, to really to meditate on how those, the people of Israel, 1250 BC, let's say, were drinking from the rock. We know the story, you know, Moses strikes the rock and they do drink. That rock, Paul says, is Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us. We should not crave evil things as they also craved. So there we get, there's a, there's a lesson here. We can learn from them. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. That's a reference to the golden calf uh, scenario. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day. <clears throat> nor let us try the Lord or test the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Those are references to numbers. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction. And then we, we touched on this, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. 
upon the ends of the ages. So, since the time of Christ, the day of Pentecost, we've been living in the last days. Um, we tend to think of end times scenarios in the same kind of sequential way. This is going to happen, that's going to happen, this is going to happen, and then the Lord's going to return. Well, that the Lord we the Lord we believe with confidence is returning. But reading history with this kind of sequential point by point on a single kind of pathway line, this is what Paul is not doing. He's, he, uh, let me say that differently. He accepts that sort of point by point sequence, but he understands that God interacts, God who is eternal is interacting with us in a way bigger than just this point by point along the line. So in a, in a way that I would say is more than mere symbol, Christ is really present with God's people in the wilderness. And it, this reading the Bible backwards is, is, it's my attempt to help us think about how, excuse me, how God, through the scriptures, God who is eternal, who's not limited by time in time the way we are limited we we experience time in a sequence you know i i can imagine the future we're in the present i can remember the past so it's sort of like on a line that that we're following well well that's how we experience time god doesn't not limited that way well then if god if 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 we're if we're meeting god through scripture then how does scripture show us, give us glimpses of this way of God relating his eternal nature to the world. All right. Upon, the in, uh, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So, questions. Oh, moving on. Sorry. <laughs> Let's now go to Matthew 24, 36 through 44. We're going to read, we're going to read Matthew 24, then we'll read Genesis 6, then we'll read 1 Peter 3, then we'll read Hebrews 11, just that one verse. And so I need, I need a volunteer to read each of them. Then we're going to go back, you can see in the parenthesis, we have these, <laughs> these uh, prophetic references in Matthew 24, but we got to get the we got to get all the stuff on the table. So who would read Matthew 24, 36 through 44? I have it. Okay, Linda. And then Genesis <laughs> 6, 5 through 22. I'll read that. Okay. Christine will read Genesis 6, then 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. I'll read it. Okay. Who was that? Bandit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Hebrews 11, 7. Okay, fine. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, All right. Now, what I want us to, as we're reading, okay, again, we can, we, there's there's the kind of direct common sense understanding of what Jesus is saying. And we're these other we're we're gonna find that then all these scriptures, and some of you have read these scriptures, uh, I mean in preparation for tonight, but we're gonna find that there are certain images that show up in all four scriptures. So again, thinking about when we when we read the scripture, God's the eternal God in kind of introducing us or bringing us into this vision of time that isn't limited to just this kind of point by point one follows after the other with a single meaning i'll say more about that later but, but <coughs> i'm asking us to kind of practice thinking about 
this other way of reading that doesn't follow just a one simple line. Okay, Matthew 24. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. All right. <clears throat> Genesis. Genesis 6, 5 through 22. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it, the length of the ark, 300 cubits, its width, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above, and put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you, will, you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark. To keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten, and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Okay. So this we would say, of course, in Genesis, this is the original story. And Jesus, talking with his disciples, makes reference to this story. So I'm stating the obvious here, I know. Now we're going to read 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Okay, here we have a reference to Noah's Ark that includes Christ. 
and we get a certain kind of understanding of the ark that goes far beyond the original story. Again, I'm kind of stating what's pretty evident, pretty mm -hmm. obvious, but I'm trying to get us to start thinking about the implications now. Now we've we've taken a story, we're 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 understanding it and applying it, so to speak, quite differently than the original story has it. And the question then is, you know, scholars might say, is this a legitimate way of interpreting Noah's Ark? You know, is it, are we just reading meaning into the story? Are we illegitimately using the story for other purposes? These are the kinds of questions that, that people ask, at least scholars do, and then you get commentaries that that vary. Um, okay, uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment. We have one more verse. By faith, Noah, <clears throat> warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. Okay, <clears throat> you know that whole that whole chapter eleven makes reference to a number of people who are uh, exemplars of faith, and they're part of the great cloud of witnesses. Um, Romans twelve one says. Um, so that seems, you know, that seems pretty straightforward. There, using using uh, Noah and the ark as a, as an example of faithful response, but again. Here we have the New Testament interpreting the Old Testament in a, in a particular kind of way. All right. What I'd like to do now is, again, to try to get things on the table here. Let's go back and look at these scriptures. So we'll go, go back to Matthew 24 and look at these <laughs> Old Testament references and complicate things a little further. So Isaiah 13 <laughs> 10. Well, let's do it this way. Back in Matthew 24. Um, if therefore, I'm not used to reading this Bible, so I'm having a hard time finding my place. If therefore they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west. All right. And then verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Isaiah 13, 10. <laughs> Now, I, I do want to re remind us that Matthew, so the, the English translation of Matthew, M Matthew used the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. The Old Testament in our Bibles are based on the Masoretic text. So it's not going to read exactly like we would expect it to read because there's a translation in between, so to speak. Um, but still, we just keeping that in mind, it's still very close and recognizable. So Isaiah 13, 10 says, For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Why? What's the situation? What is Isaiah prophesying here? The crucifixion. Well, yeah, I mean that's a that's we get, that's we get there, but in its immediate context in Isaiah, if you go back to the beginning of chapter thirteen, you see it's re referencing Babylon. Yeah. Okay. 
And then if you look at verse six, well, for the day of the Lord is near, it will come as destruction from the Almighty and so on. Okay, so Babylon, let's keep this in mind. Isaiah 13 says the sun will be darkened uh, and the moon will not shed its light, etc. Related to Babylon. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 7. Well, pages are sticking together. Oh, there it is again. Isaiah 32 7. And, and when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light, and so on. Okay, who is God talking to in Ezekiel? Prophet. If you go back, yeah. Pharaoh in Egypt. That's right. So in Egypt. So it's the same kind of statement addressed to a different power. So even within, even within the Old Testament, we have scripture interpreting scripture. So just think about this for a second. So God speaking through the prophets using the same or very, very similar imagery to make a point to the powers, to empire. Uh, is that because God can't think of anything else to say? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so why does scripture why is scripture sort of interpreting or using scripture here there's a there's something powerful and appropriate about the the image the symbol the figure that that also speaks to the the eternal god now addressing at a different point in time and a different group of people, but it's the very same kind of message. I'm I'm just throwing, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of come at this from different angles now to get us thinking about time and how God is addressing us through these scriptures with a, with a kind of different understanding of time than we normally have. All right, Daniel, back in, uh, back in Matthew, 24, we find uh, boy, I just cannot I get so used to one version of the Bible and then I can't get my Oh, yeah. Verse 30, 24, 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels, etc. So let's now go to Daniel 7, 13. And so I don't have to hear my own voice for the moment. Would somebody read Daniel 7, 13? I can. Yeah. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. Yeah. So human being, son of man. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Matthew, Jesus in Matthew is quoting also from Daniel 7, 13. So we have these two prophetic words from Isaiah and Ezekiel addressed to the powers, Babylon and Egypt. So we could go back and look at the historical circumstances of Isaiah and Ezekiel, and we could, you know, we could, we could get into the symbolism related to those historical circumstances, and we could, we could, we could say, oh, well, that's what it means. 
But then we come to the New Testament and we see Matthew, Jesus and Matthew, using these same Im images in a way that, well, he's not just talking about what happened back then. Now Jesus is talking about what's yet to come. So, so is Jesus not using these texts properly? Well, we would never think that. So again, we expand, we try to reach a little bit for what's going on in the way to understand the meaning of these texts. All right, back to <coughs> Isaiah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I, th I have found when I'm reading the Old Testament that I the hard thing for me is to re is to try to understand what they mean in their own context because right. I've been taught, I think, that they didn't really have any meaning then. <laughs> they only mean something for later. Like at the time, like I, I understood at the time that those prophecies that were being spoken, yeah, like they just went over everybody's head because like, what does that mean? It, 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 because it's something that is only for the future. You know what I'm saying? Instead of actually understanding that it applied to them and their time, I have made the stupid assumption that it that they didn't get any of it because it only applied forward. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that's a good a good point. So that's a different way of the of kind of following the same point by point. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the present at all. It's all about the future. Yeah. Yeah. And then then it's fulfilled in Christ, and then we're done. Yeah. Right. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> So I guess if I could use a spatial kind of reference, instead of just following a line, what we're doing with time is we're spreading it out wider. Uh, to try to to try to get a sense of what's going on. And that's not a great way of saying it either, but I don't know how to say it without getting way too deep in kind of the nature of time and all that. All right. Isaiah 27, 13. I can do that. Thank you. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria, and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt, will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Okay, now where do you see that, that, that idea in Matthew 24? Thirty-one. He will send his angels out with a loud trumpet. Right, a great trumpet. My version says, "Gather the elect from the four winds." Right. Okay. Now Zechariah nine fourteen says, "The Lord will appear over them, and His arrow will go forth like lightning." The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirling winds of the south. Okay, again, the same kind of imagery, but applied to two different situations, shall we say. All right, now we'll just we'll kind of settle in on Matthew. So we, we're, not, we're not talking about Noah yet. We're going to talk about Noah in just a second, but... Let's go back to Matthew and get a, a, a little bit more detailed, you might say, sense of what Jesus is telling his disciples in Matthew 24. They're on the Mount of Olives. This is the, the last week of Jesus' life. And the tensions with the religious authorities have really been mounting. And everybody can feel like something's going to happen. The disciples think Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem and clean house and set up his kingdom in a very literal way. And so you might say the possibility of violence or conflict and, you, you know, this, this is going on. And now Jesus is drawing on these moments of time from the past to help communicate what's, what's happening right now in the present. 
So based on, can we, can we draw together now, like these, these, these Old Testament references that are embedded in Matthew 24, what's the picture we get? And I'm just asking you to think out loud. What are the elements of the picture that we're getting? Chaos. Chaos? Is that what you said? That's what I said, yeah. Okay. All right. The Son of Man will come without warning. S son of <clears throat> Will come like a lightning. <laughs> without warning. Oh, I got you. I thought you said morning. Without warning. Right. Okay. What is this? What is the sun going to do? It's going to be like an eclipse where everything just gets dark and then <laughs> mm -hmm. raw. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is Jesus doing now? What's he doing in Matthew 24? What's he doing? If we look at those scriptures, he's gathering he's the elect. He's. Okay. He wants to be watchful. The Son of Man is going to be presented to the Ancient of Days. Well, how's that going to happen? The trumpet will sound. <laughs> Crucifixion and resurrection. See, this is this is our struggle. Uh, this is our struggle. It's not. It is. It is not. It's just not commonsensically clear. There's just no way in five seconds to put my finger on the text and go, oh, that's what it means. Particularly this kind of uh, writing that we're reading in, in Matthew 24. But if you, if you step back and you were to read that whole section again, Jesus is saying, don't be fooled by people who claim to be the Messiah. And we do remember that there were people during Jesus' time, broadly speaking, before and after Jesus, every once in a while, somebody in Israel would rise up, get a following, try to throw the bums out, the Romans, and they would be defeated. And so they were claimants to the title of Messiah. So Jesus is saying, don't be fooled by them. Some things are going to happen. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I, I feel like this passage is really hard because, uh, because of our, the, the prominence in our culture of, of like rapture theology. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the people, <laughs> yeah, you're right. people, I thought about that. You know, one, one of my, one of my acquaintances who's a PhD in New Testament, a New Testament scholar, he does these videos, you know, and he's, he, he's done a couple of videos anyway on the Bible doesn't teach the rapture. And one, one reason, he'll say, it's good to be left behind. He's kind of playing on the Jerry Jenkins, you know, <laughs> it's good to be left behind. Because if you read it, okay, now we are getting to Noah, at least for the moment. When Noah goes in the boat, right, who gets swept away? Everybody else gets swept away. The people left behind are the people in the ark. So <laughs> then, thought about it in that way. verse 40 in Matthew, then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women grinding at the, at the mill. One will be taken, or uh, mm -hmm. yeah, grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. The person left behind, so to speak, is, is, is analogous to Who's in the ark? So, so I, I never noticed until ha reading him like this, yeah. how it first it talks about how Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about the flood. And then two, because two of every kind went into the ark. Right. Here we have two. Right. And then we have two. Yeah. And it's like, okay, yeah. that's interesting. And it's even interesting. two in the Noah set scenario it says 
take two of every kind, male and female. And yeah. in this example, it's a, um, two males, women, yeah. two females. Yeah. And it's like, oh my gosh. Right. Okay, but so isn't this part of, like when you look at Noah and then you look at the Babylonians and then you look at the Egyptians and yeah. Pharaoh, and then to me, it seems like this is kind of the way things get really bad. And that's the way that God intercedes to save his people right but it yes that's that's true but in this particular case what we have now with christ coming i mean you know christ is making these references to the old testament and mm -hmm. applying them to himself okay <laughs> uh so we we look at we look at the passages in the Old Testament. God is gathering a people, Israel. Right. God is restoring a people. He's gathering them after the exile and all that. He's gathering them to reform a people. So what, what we see in Matthew is um, Jesus is doing what God does. Mm -hmm. He is the Messiah. He's gathering God's people to form a nation and overthrowing, in this case, now it's Rome, Babylon, Egypt, Rome. The power now is Rome. So, okay, we can, we can think it out just the way I said it, and we can still follow the kind of that was then, and now we're, since we're, we're looking at what Jesus has done, well, now we can sort of put our minds as if we're in the present with Jesus. We're one of the disciples hearing him say these things. But technically, or not technically, but in reality, we also sort of look back on this is what Jesus said at a particular point in time. And we, we can still kind of stick on this line of just seeing things as, okay, he's drawing on the past. And now we read about the past and all this happened in the past. And what we're doing now is we're waiting until the future for these other things to happen when it's really finally all finished. That's a kind of singular meaning to these texts that we have to get. We need the experts. We need the scholars to get these things all lined up for us. We know what that means in its context. We know what this means in its context. And we put everything together in the proper context and following the right directions, we can get the meaning of the scriptures. Now, what I'm what I'm grappling with and asking us to grapple with is what if we saw more meaning in these texts and realized that rather than just this kind of historical point by point, follow the chronology out, which we're not, I'm not disagreeing with that. That doesn't go away. But what if there's more going on in the meaning of the text that that draws us into the story quite in a very real way draw we're now we're now being put in the story as well or to think of it this way the scriptures are kind of reading us while we read the scripture and if this doesn't make sense I don't know if it makes sense to me yet. I'm still kind of working this out. But what we're doing is we're, 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 I am trying to help us practice reading the scripture the way our Christian forebears read it for centuries before we get to the modern period and got very aware of this kind of one way of reading the Bible. Now, I want to be careful. This is not pay your nickel, take your choice. It's not just you can make up any meaning. You can find any meaning in the text. It's not that either. I mean, there are boundaries on the meaning of the text. But now when we go to look at Noah specifically, now we can look at, for example, how First Peter Sorry, got away from my we did all that. So now first Peter, how does first Peter read what we've been looking at? So
Now let's go to 1 Peter 3, and let me ask this question. What is the view of time we find in this 1 Peter 3 passage? Anybody got a got an idea? Well, it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. What do you mean all over the place? Time. Well, because he suffered once uh, for all, once for all. So in the past, he's he suffered for the future. The righteous for the unrighteous in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh. Um and in which he also went and made pro proclamations to the spirits in prison. So that's like he then went into the past. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it 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 it, it is a picture of J Jesus or transcending time. Like in one sentence, he's present in the past, present, and future. Yeah, so so clearly this the text uses the past tense. Jesus did this, mm -hmm. right, in the past. Um, now, the interesting thing in this version that I'm using, it says in verse 19, he went and made procl proclamation to the spirits now in prison. And that word now is not really literally in the Greek text, but... Here the translators are saying it's very much implied by the words that are used in the Greek text. So made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. All right, let's think about this. During the days of Noah, these people, this, these disobedient people died. And a long time later, Jesus dies and now he's proclaiming the gospel to those who are in prison. So if they're dead, how is it that they're hearing the gospel? Now, you know, there are implications to this that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure about. But, but we're trying to get our minds around this vision of time and history. God is not limited the way we're limited in time. Okay, so what does Jesus do through the death and resurrection? He does not take the dirt from our bodies. <laughs> He's <laughs> victorious <laughs> over death. <laughs> right. Now, again, uh, you, you know, this is far beyond any, some, from, uh, Question, I, I'm thinking of questions in my head now that I, I don't exactly know how to answer. However, the one thing that's really coming across is, if I could say it this way, and this is, of course, I say this with all due humility, the way God experiences time is not the way we experience time. And if the scriptures reveal God to us, the scriptures are not time bound in the way that we may think they are. You know, this stuff happened back then and, and the historian wants to say, well, did they get that right or not? Does that really reflect what actually happened or not? Is this a myth? Is it a something? And, and that's all, you, you know, we need scholars to do that kind of work. But if God is speaking through these texts, then the eternal God, who's not limited by time in the way we are limited by time, has more to say to us through these scriptures than that kind of literal, step-by-step, -step, historical understanding of everything would, would, uh, would suggest. So, I, that, I mean, you hear people say, that God is speaking it, it, through this through Scripture instead of 
God spoke. Right. Right. All right. So let's press on a little bit here to what does the ark refer in First Peter? Baptism, isn't it? Hmm. That water saved them. Mm -hmm. Hey, did you all hear that? It's referring to baptism? Yes. Okay. It there there clearly is a parallel between the waters of baptism and the waters of the flood. There's a parallel. But what is the ark? Is the ark the baptism? Mm -hmm. Same through water. Through water. Yeah, they they pass through the water. In the ark. But the yeah, they're in the ark. I mean, it's the ark. It's the ark that saves them from death in the water. <clears throat> so he'd be referring to Christ. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So and what's referring to Christ? The water. The ark. The ark. Oh, the ark. Christ goes through the water right it goes through but weren't they saved by the water destroying the corruption on the earth that that is a, that's an apt connection but again i think mm -hmm. the waters the waters of baptism have a role it doesn't say they were saved by the water they were saved through the water. Exactly. It's like they somehow survived They're, through the water. Those, through through the water. water. Yes. So the water was your troubles or your your temp, your sufferings in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly in 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 Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a sign of judgment. But in the ark, where the eight people are safe and saved. It's really Jesus' death and resurrection then that is symbolized by the ark, because that's what saves us. Jesus' death and resurrection. My sit my that's says they were saved from the water by the water. Say from the water by the water? Say from the water by the water. Oh wow. I wonder what version she's reading. I'm is using the, the message. <laughs> ah, the message. Oh, okay. I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's interesting. So it is interesting because we we have the word baptism here, and uh, it's, I mean, baptism is into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. Like it. Yeah. It is centered on. Uh, it's centered on Jesus and on 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 God. Right. And since it, you know, we, I, I have a, t I have a habit of, you know, like I read the word baptism and instead of kind of asking, what does that reference? I just think of our actions that we do when we baptize somebody, just putting somebody under water or sprinkling water on them. Right. But that, that baptism in its real meaning that you're like, in, in a sense, putting on Christ as it's referred to other in other places, then that sentence makes sense. Then, yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but again, and we would have to keep working on this for a while, that the means of salvation is not baptism. Well, that's what I was oh, just trying yeah. to say. I know. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not the water. Yeah. Baptism doesn't, I mean, it says that baptism is, a, is a, a, an appeal to God for a good conscience. So there, there's a very central role to baptism. But the means of salvation, according to 1 Peter 3 here, is Christ who died, who rose again, and who now sits at the right hand of the Father. So in the Noah story, in Genesis, it's the ark. It gets them through the flood. 
The ark in 1 Peter 3 is Christ. The means of salvation is Christ. So yeah. in that one passage, what am I thinking? Was that from last week's? Where they're talking about the rock going with yeah. ahead of, yeah. ahead of yeah. while they were right. in there. So right. that rock was Christ. The rock, the rock was Christ. That's right. Okay, so Christ has been through in all of these. That's right. And again, that is, see, that's that reference to the Old Testament story. I mean, we would read that and go from a literal kind of historical approach. It's ridiculous to think that Christ is the rock, right? But reading it from a New Testament death and resurrection, ascension to heaven perspective, where we realize now Christ really is the center point of human history. He is the reason, right? He's God come to be with us. Now, that's this is the idea of reading the Bible backwards. Now, Paul shows us that we can see in stories like that one from Exodus and the one we're looking at tonight from Genesis, our way of kind of going point by point and one following the next and all that, uh, we we it would be very easy to read First Peter three and and not make the connection between the ark and Christ. But then now the ark is a kind of a prefiguring the ark through the water. So Christ and our faith in Christ symbolized by baptism, and, and I'm using the word symbol here in a very rich sense. So baptism is, is, is very important in this picture. And you could say those together, the ark and the waters, show us something about salvation. Now, if I'm just thinking about Noah and the ark, and you, you know, I could go, oh, they've made a kind of nice symbolic connection but no peter is saying jesus christ is the ark right it's a much stronger it is symbolic but it's symbolic with it with a kind of impact and so now kind of stepping back and looking at okay how does this help me think about reading scripture it's not that i want to go just you know way overboard with now i can see symbols and connections everywhere and I get sloppy about it. I don't want to do that. But what I do want to do is start to notice when the Bible makes these connections, I want to see those connections and realize, wow, so God is confronting me, us, the readers, in a way that this kind of one, one approach doesn't reveal. So isn't that kind of what the first chapter of John is about, where he says, mm -hmm. I was in the Word, and the Word was mm -hmm. with me in the beginning? Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I think it was last week, Steve, or maybe it was the week before that, that you said um, that it that we should be reading, that that the stories that we read about God in the Old Testament, we need to keep in our the forefront of our heads. That is the triune God. Right. That's right. So it's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit yeah. present. And so maybe it just having that sets us up to do a better job of right. what you're talking about right. now. Right. Yeah. And I, I think what I'm really trying to get across is if we read the Bible closely and start to notice the details and not, uh, not what I think is sort of jumping to the conclusion, to certain conclusions, because we've learned how to read the Bible, this means that, right? Uh, and I'll, I'll get to this point. Uh, but if, if we slow down on that a little bit and start to notice the details without, without having to tie everything down and make it all night and nice, like solving a puzzle, we find God speaking to us in, in ways that we probably wouldn't have noticed beforehand. In one sense, I'm kind of stating the obvious, I think, but in another way, I think this is a really important point. So here's, here's me trying to say 
say what I've been trying to say this way. So this historicist reading, and I'm following a couple of scholars on this that, you know, that are the Bible experts. They are the experts. And I'm trying to channel them a little bit. So there's a certain way of reading the Bible that says, it assumes, we got to get all the historical references lined up in sequence. We've got to put them in their proper context. And then by doing those things, we will know what the Bible means. And there's only that one meaning that's tied to the historical narrative. So we got to get everything lined up. This is why we need the scholars to tell us, well, the context was this and that. And that's all good and necessary. But if we assume that there's this just this one meaning in this one text because there's this one historical reference and it, it happened exactly this way, then we're missing a good deal of what the Bible has to tell us. On the other hand, this figural reading, which is based on a historical reading, this, this, these are not opposed to each other. A figural reading notices these literary associations. Like tonight, the literary association has been flood, Noah, ark, baptism, etc. So these are word associations that break us out of just thinking about something that happened way back then. And it does give us a view of time that isn't just, maybe I shouldn't have said nonlinear, but it's not, it's just not limited in the way we often think of history being limited to just this way of, of seeing things. Okay, I'm going to try one or two more of these examples, <laughs> and then we're going to move on to something else. But the takeaway, I think, is, is simply this. I don't have a lot of brilliant insights into the meaning of these texts. What I'm trying to do is show us the takeaway is let's slow down and notice when the Bible does things like First Peter is doing or, or Jesus is doing in Matthew 24 or Paul does in Galatians 4 when he, when he talks about the two women you know, and the two cities. I mean, he's not just reading the Bible in that historical way. He's he's reading the Bible to use this word that's that's foreign to most of us in this particular way. He's reading the Bible figurally, typologically. All right. That's how the Greeks read history, right? <laughs> How or many it was figurally? Oh, it wasn't linear. It wasn't linear that necessarily, but it, the way they understood history was more figural than it was literal or sequential. Yeah, what I know of the Greek Greeks and their view of history is more that they 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 didn't have any grand theory about history. What they did. When, when they read history, it was pretty limited to like our city and our okay. fate, the fate of our city and these battles and things like that. So it's fairly limited. I, you, okay. you could very well be right. I don't know about this kind of the bigger picture theory about history. And here we are dealing, you know, the Bible is comprehensive. I mean, it's, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing left out in terms of the scope of the Bible for revealing God and God's will to us. Um, all right. Yeah. See, so I, I had, when I was reading this, I had um, looked up what is an arc <laughs> because, uh, you know, the only two arcs in the Bible are the Ark of the Covenant and uh, Noah's Ark, yeah, you know? Yeah. And the the definition that I read was that it's a sacred chest. And, you know, it's a beautiful picture of Noah and the, the animals that were saved in a sacred chest because they were, you know, because of the creation of humans being good. Yeah. But then it, what we're reading, what we read today is if Christ was is the ark you know it's like 
the beloved son. Oh. The the ark is the beloved son. So I don't know that it's a sacred, it's a sacred chest. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't exactly know what I think about what you just said, but I, I would say this: it does it does suggest that. Um, well. <laughs> Oh, the what dictionaries do <laughs> you can tell I'm struggling here what dictionaries do is they give us the basic meaning of a word and they give us a few examples of how it's applied but but it's not necessarily the case that the dictionary definition with those examples captures how this particular usage of that word in the bible is being used right and that's that's that, that's why there's there's often more to the picture than what we get if we just read what the dictionary definition says. And the dictionary, the yeah, the dictionary is not going to say that the ark was Christ. Yeah, that's for no, sure. No, it didn't say that. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> I was. Yeah. Yeah. So and and here you you know here's another thing that I'm trying to get across. There's no, there's no um, risk-free roadmap guide person to follow on what we're doing. There's no rule book that I can go to to make sure I stay with the method. Because what we're talking about is not exactly a method. It's just a way of reading very closely to try to notice the details and then work with the experience of coming to understand what's going on. And that doesn't mean we're just sloppily making up things. We use the dictionaries. We use the commentaries. We do, we do all we can to gather understanding of context, etc. But if God is speaking to us through these texts, then we are, we're, we're just, we're kind of on in a different modality in a different posture with Bible study. The Bible isn't just an object in front of us that we're trying to decipher. The Bible comes becomes to us the means by which God confronts us. And figural reading is a is a way of practicing seeing this other these other dimensions to the Bible. I appreciate your patience and your willingness as, <laughs> as, as we try to work this out. So we're going to do this one or two more times maximum, and then we'll, then we'll uh, move on. All right, friends. Thanks a lot. Bye, God bless you. Bye. Bye. Good night.